what he did in terms of global marketing and giving other black athletes a blueprint to do that was quite revolutionary. Thanks for taking the time to, to talk, Yami. It's much appreciated. Um, yeah, I, okay. I appreciate these press junkets. You, do, you are just doing back to back. So That's okay. no ho- ho- hopefully I'll make this, uh, this, this fun for you. Uh, well, as, as much as possible. Um, no problem. Uh, so, I mean, for those who, who don't know you then, who don't know your, your background, um, uh, well, first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about um, where this will be going out. We run a, a basketball website called Double Clutch, um, mm. which is sort of a, a UK NBA, WNBA website. We, we are sort of expanding into BBL and things like that as well. Yeah. But, um, we, 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 we don't always do stuff about sneaker culture, but so, sometimes... Mm you know, things come along that really tickle our readers and listeners' interests. So, Mm. um, especially when it comes to Jumpman, you know, and we saw such a spike on the website during like the last dance and things like that. But this is, of course, you know, a bit of a, almost like an, an, antithesis of, uh, of the last dance in some ways that was such a celebration and this is taking on a a, a bit of a different path. So, um, But before we go too much into the film, what, what's mm. where, what's your relationship with Jumpman, and and when did that start, and how how did you get to um, learn about the Jordan brand and and things like that? Uh, well, I remember sort of you know being a teenager in South London and uh, in the nineties, and and sort of remembering how big a deal the Chicago Bulls was and that franchise as was, you know, and, and the fact that Michael Jordan was basically, you know, the king of that. He was like a basketball god who oversaw that, that franchise. Um, and I, that's where my following sort of started. Um, you know, the Bulls were, you know, it, it that was an association with excellence, with just brilliance that a team could sort of like win that many championships and play in the way that they played and sort of like have all of these incredible players with their own sort of like personalities um, with, with, uh, with Michael Jordan at the helm of that. So yeah, that's where it all started. I was always hyper aware of, you know, what that was and what that meant. Um, And I guess also, 90s NBA is just probably like my favorite, you know, iteration of the NBA in yeah. terms of like, you know, if you're looking at it from a, a decade perspective, I think just, you know, the players, um, the fact that it was when, you know, it made its mass market breakthrough in terms of like globalization yeah. and, and reaching all corners of, of the world. Um, yeah, I, I, so I'm a sort of like a, a sucker for sort of anything 90s um, and the NBA in the 90s and particularly the Bulls and Jordan was has always been a, a sweet spot for me because I just remember that time yeah. uh, and I remember what it was like. I wouldn't say I'm a huge basketball fan, you know, okay. but it was just, you know, I think it was just the Bulls. I, I, followed, I followed the NBA, but, you know, I followed the Bulls and I followed sort of, you know, their kind of, their, their journey and, and, and their winning streak. So that's yeah. where it all sort of started. So when it, uh, how, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? You're, you're 30, probably... I'm, 30, I'm 37. 37, okay. So yeah, so you, you're, you're sort of a similar age to the people, the people that run Double Clutch primarily. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm a little bit younger, but yeah, I remember those days where, you, you know, yeah, Jordan and the and the Bulls t- took over the NBA, and Michael Jordan took over the world, especially in the Barcelona Olympics. You know, it felt like he was everywhere. Mm. Um, mm. So, mm. when was it that you started working towards becoming um, a filmmaker? Then, you know, how um, and why did you? What what sort of drew you to looking at Jordan Brand and basketball, particularly? So, I've worked in TV. Um, that's that's sort of like where this all sort of started. I've worked in TV since I was about 21 and uh, I started thinking about this story in 2012 um, because I'd always had ambitions to sort of tell feature length stories and to tell stories that you know perhaps that people could watch in the cinema that were you know 
good enough for a theatrical run or you know deemed good enough to be classed as cinematic so I started thinking about you know how I might uh, do that at the back end of 2012 and then I started thinking about subjects that I might you know want to you know tell you know make a film about and I gravitate I gravitated towards uh Jordan and sort of like this story because because of the fact that I'd never seen it before you know so first and foremost on a surface level I had an interest in it and I I knew about it but I'd never seen anything that you know had told like the brand Jordan story from a, a origin perspective um I liked the idea of thinking about you know these guys as architects of architects of sneaker culture in a weird way so you know the sort of the shoe designers and whether that be peter moore or sort of like sonny vaquero david falk these guys who were like maybe in their 30s or 40s in the 70s in in the 70s who are now you know a little bit older now i like thinking about them as sort of being you know the guard the people that started this so-called sneaker culture so yeah, I started thinking about how I could tell this story with the men and women that were responsible for this phenomenon. And yeah, this is an independent endeavor. So it was always yeah. going to be, you know, uh, it was always going to be sort of like an uphill sort of like struggle to get it made. But I was aware that no one was ever going to come along and give us a pot of money and say like, here's, here's, here's a pot of money, go and make your film. Yeah. So I, kn- I knew that we would have to sort of do it ourselves, but we were at peace with that. And we just went about making the film, knowing that, knowing what, knowing that, you know, we wanted to tell the story in this way and knowing that we were from TV and we could sort of like, we had that get up and go to sort of not necessarily wait around for funding and, and just kind of like do it ourselves as a sort of like side project, labor of love, like passion project sort of thing. Cool. So, I mean, I, I watched the film. It's fantastic, brilliantly produced film. So congratulations. It's, um, I, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and the, the, the beginning of it, it is, as you said, it's, it, it's a celebration of all these people, of all these um, mm. sneaker culture people. Uh, mm. Like you said, Sonny, you've interviewed Sonny Vaccaro, but mm. you also looked at it through a sort of social lens as well. You know, you, you mm. had uh, Jamel Hill, a fantastic spokesperson on so many subjects, but, mm. um, and Russ Bankston, of course, mm. you know, a, a god in the sneaker culture landscape. Mm. Um, mm. So how how was it tracking down all these people then and and why did you specifically opt to begin the film in this celebratory way i i wanted to tell the story of the air jordan sneaker uh, and i wanted to tell it by uh, the most reliable storytellers and sort of uh contributors that we could find and so that would obviously be people that were either in the rooms when these deals were going down or people that had pretty much lived this their whole career. So you refer to Russ Bankston, you know, his, you know, he's probably like one of the most authoritative voices on sneaker culture in America. So it was important that he was in the film. Jamil Hill, I remember when she was a a, a news correspondent journalist at uh, ESPN, Mm -hmm. incredible sort of like personality and journalist and not shy to sort of like speak about issues that, you know mean something so she was important uh peter moore the original sort of like designer of the air jordan one um i think people kind of forget that you know he started this you know he designed the air jordan one and the air jordan two i you know history has a weird way of almost like forgetting stuff and i think the, this newfound phenomenon of sneaker culture uh, likes to think that Tinker Hatfield is like, you know, the be all and end all of this whole phenomenon. And Peter Moore gave Tinker Hatfield his job. So I was interested in sort of like tracking down these people uh, that perhaps weren't associated with this brand anymore and getting them on record to tell me some of these stories and to tell me how this all happened. Because, yeah, I felt a little bit like our responsibility was like, archivists you know like let's you know let's talk to these people who are a little bit older now some of them if you're talking about Sonny and Peter Moore and David Falk who you know at peace with their legacy at peace with their contribution and 
are just happy to sort of like talk to a random guy from South London about, you know, their part in all of this. So tracking them down was pretty, it was pretty simple to be fair. It just took a long time, you know, it sort of started with, I would say like Roland Lazenby, who is Michael Jordan's biographer. He wrote an incredible uh, book biography on Michael Jordan called The Life. And he obviously spoke to everybody when he um, embarked on that project. And he was one of the first people that I spoke to. He's an amazing man. He was really generous with his time. He believed in the project and he helped just connect the dots for me. You know, he helped me get in touch with Sonny. Sonny then took probably two years to get involved. Uh, but, you know, Sonny's just, you know, Sonny's a legend. He's not yeah. just going to, you know, you're not just going to pick up the phone or sort of send him an email and he's going to agree to be in your documentary. You know, he is part of the fabric of sneaker culture and college basketball. So, yeah, I, I guess it was about nurturing relationships and like just um, just allowing people, you know, the, the time to think about this. And not everyone that you ask is always going to say yes to be in your documentary. And we had the luxury of time. and yeah i think that allowed us to get some of the people that we got on board but we were definitely lucky you know with some yeah. of them and you know but you kind of make your own luck and i think yeah we deserved it i think because we were really persistent and we just really you know it we, we always wanted these people to serve this story we didn't want to make a fanboy story a fanboy film that was sort of like you know a bit anarchy a little bit kind of like oh like jordans aren't they great we wanted to, to be you know authentic and we wanted the best storytellers and we wanted people that would serve the story we wanted everybody in the film to sort of like have a place and i think we kind of did that yeah and i think one person you sort of um that we haven't really touched on j just yet is is rick tallander who yeah. um wrote this you know that that was sort of uh, really a turning point in the story it, it bridged the gap between it being this celebration of sneaker culture and um, mm. getting all this insight into the into the social importance of of people wearing these you know fantastic clothes and fantastic mm. sneakers and mm. then uh, Rick Tallander's uh, entry point where um, it highlighted that someone had been killed over a mm. pair of Jordans and mm. uh, from that point you realized where this film was going um, mm. did, did you set out when you first um, when you first planned to do this documentary? Did mm. you set out to highlight the um, y you know the the sort of dark side of not just Jordan Brand but I guess capitalism at large? Really, it you know you told it through the lens of of Jumpman and Jordan, mm. but mm. this is an issue that I think y you know is is all across um, capitalism in, in in so many mm. brands and different ways yeah no correct uh yeah no you're you're completely right um i think the short answer is yes i i didn't know how you could tell a story about the air jordan sneaker and the legacy of this sneaker and not talk about the fact that people for you know the best part of 35 years have been getting murdered or that there was a violence that surrounded this this sneaker i didn't feel that it would be correct um to kind of like make this film and not explore that because it, I th it felt like a responsibility to myself to will to michael the two producers and the editor to 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 make a definitive coherent comprehensive film that encapsulated you know the actual legacy of the air jordan sneaker the walk to all you know I, th I think it was really important to explore that um, and yeah, so I knew from the beginning because when I was a teenager in South London, um, you know, following the balls and following Jordan, I, you know, I, I remember hearing stories about, you know, kids on the, on the subway in New York city getting robbed for their air Jordans. You know, I remember that quite vividly. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't, I, I didn't know how we could tell this story without, you know exploring that that element of of the shoes uh, legacy i think um the one of the main people you centered around was, was joshua woods who um mm. you know he bought several pairs of jordans um mm. was it's if it sounded like he was only a few feet away from his house you know or he was he was mm. on his on his street but he'd mm. been followed home from the store and mm. and and killed for all these jordans um mm. one of the things that struck me was when you were interviewing his sister um and i think mm. it struck you as well because you 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 asked her to repeat the answer but um michael jordan after learning of of joshua woods's death 
sent mm. sent the sister a, a mm. pair of shoes and she said it mm. felt like receiving a pair of sweets to stop you crying as a child mm. Mm. that that's pretty heartbreaking now it, it mm. must have been difficult to sort of um get some of these people to trust you with their stories yeah i i think yeah when it comes to the woods family i i met them uh i met them in 2014 and and that was not long after you know joshua had been murdered and yeah it took an it took about a year six months to a year to sort of you know phone conversations and emails and just yeah i'm perhaps six months for to even get someone to call me back to get daisy to call me back and then once we had a correspondence it was yeah she was con, you know in, incredibly courageous and open with you know what she was willing to share mm-hmm. um and i i I don't think it was necessarily difficult. I just wanted to communicate and let her know that, you know, there was no hidden agenda here. I was just interested in, you know, her son and 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 his story. And I think at the time, Daisy was basically running an online campaign, um, sort of like a charity called Life Over Fashion, where she was trying to bring awareness of the fact that this had happened to her son and she didn't want anyone else um, she didn't want anyone else uh to sort of like you know to 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 die in the in the same way that her son died over senseless you know violence over sneakers Mm -hmm. so yeah i don't think it was hard it was just kind of perhaps like nurturing a relationship and just knowing just getting someone to know that they could trust me and and this process and in telling the story because I, i think ultimately she you know she she kind of like revealed to me that she was quite um surprised that you know the tr- the story had traveled so far you know like you know i i, I found about this i found out about the story because i think it might have been in the guardian um, oh, right. yeah. Uh, yeah it was in a it was in a kind of like a british newspaper that's how i found out about the story and then i kind of just went around getting in touch with her so i think initially she was just a little bit overwhelmed by the fact that you know people over here you know were aware of what happened with her her son and I think because she was kind of running her charity at the time and wanted to raise awareness she was happy to sort of like share you know her memories and her experience of this really tragic and unfortunate um situation that had happened to her so after telling her story and several other people's stories during this process mm. then mm. you know you said that you've you've a long time fan of uh, you know not so much basketball but of the Chicago Bulls of Jordan mm. Mm. We're, what what do you feel about about him and about the brand today? Because you you know I I still wear Jordans and I'm I'm wearing a Jordan hat and I'm wearing mm. you know I, I wear Jumpman clothing regularly, but making uh, you know seeing this it did sort of strike a chord because I am mm. a big Jordan fan. How how did mm. you feel going through this process? I, I I don't think I necessarily changed that much because I think the objective of any business is to make money and I think that you know. I think your moral compass is going to get thrown out of shape when things like this happen. I think, you know, their job is to sort of like sell shoes to sort of people that are wanting to buy them, mainly like young people and, and market these shoes to people. Um, I don't, I don't see how, yeah, I, I just don't see how we can look at it any differently you know i think they're this is their objective to sell shoes and you know perhaps they don't speak on this issue because they don't think it's that much of an issue you know it Mm. it, but it is an issue and i think it's it's a senseless it's senseless violence that has surrounded this shoe for so many years so what in relation what in in relation to what i feel about the brand is like you know I, i don't my opinion has necessarily changed of them but it's you know the same perhaps sense of distrust and sense of cynicism that i have with every brand that tries to sell you stuff but i think when you know making money is the, at the heart of their objective then of course like you know you're going to question their kind of like ethics and their more you know their kind of like character when it comes to issues you know like this so yeah i, I it didn't change my thought process it's kind of like it just exposes you know our love affair with consumerism and i think when you start talking about that you start talking about the evils of capitalism and that's a whole different documentaries 
I think, um, yeah, I think that it, it's only been driven into overdrive in recent years, isn't it? With the with the launch of like the sneakers app and the amount mm. of people that just get so angry, at, uh, you know, mm. on Twitter and you, you, mm. ju you just see what what this culture can do to people on uh, on the dark side. And yeah, yeah th this film is a fascinating look at, uh, at that side of it. So th thank you for making it. And, and oh, no worries. Uh, thanks, thank you thanks so for much. talking to me. And, no worries. And uh, yeah, I I guess um I just w wanted to sort of uh, ask you uh, one last question before I go. Um, of course, you yeah. also had David Stern in in the film. Yeah, who has of course yeah. passed away now. now what yeah. was it like? Um, what was it like speaking to him? Oh my God, I was starstruck. I was completely yeah. starstruck when we found out that he, you know, when his secretary emailed us and said that, you know, he would be up for doing the interview as long as it's in New York and as long as it's near his office. I was just like, oh my God, yeah, of course. And then, yeah, we sort of, we did it in a hotel near his office and he just walked in by himself, like quite small, demure guy, like really lovely, really generous with his time. Uh, yeah, I was like starstruck because this yeah. is David Stern. I think if you're going to kind of like give Nike and give, you know, Brian Jordan, uh, you know, so much credit for their role in sort of like changing the face of athlete and endorsement deals, um, then a lot of credit has to go to David Stern because he revolutionized the NBA and gave those brands and these athletes a platform to do that. You know, he, it, this all happened on his watch. You know, the globalization, the commercialization of the NBA happened on David Stern's watch. It, he is responsible, you know, for the NBA being what it is today. You know, I think the longest serving, you know, commissioner of any sports mm -hmm. sort of like brand is David Stern. So he was a legend. And, you know, I'd read about this guy. I never thought we were ever going to get him. And yeah, he was just like the nicest guy. I got a picture with him. Um, because I, you know, and I never do that, but it was yeah. just David Stern, hero. Yeah. So yeah, when I, when I found out about his passing, I was just so devastating in, yeah. in January, you know, it's, you know, but I think that, yeah, he, I think people just don't understand the impact that he had. He was an incredible marketeer and he, he just saw, he saw where the NBA, and, and he saw where the NBA is today before people even knew. You know, he knew that it was going to get to this place. He knew that it was going to be this spectacle and this fanfare uh, was going to surround it. He knew that in the in the eighties, you know, and 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 he set about sort of like, you know, putting that plan to action and 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 you know laying the foundations for all of that. Uh, and whether he meant to or not, I think he also helped supercharge the selling of of the Air Jordan ones, of course, because he banned them 100%. in the first place. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Cool. Okay, well, Yemi, th thanks for talking to me, man. Um, oh, uh, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, ho but best of luck with the film. When is, when is it officially out? Is it this week or next week? So it's, um, it had its sort of like virtual sort of like premiere at London Film Festival on the 13th. And then and after that, there's a few preview screenings um, in cinemas on the 16th, the 20th, the 23rd and the 24th. And I think, yeah. I think it gets released shortly after that. And well, I, I noticed there was, there was a BBC Films sort of production link on it. Is there, is it going to be on BBC at some point? Yeah, it's going to be on the BBC, I think, in November. Excellent. Well, our, our listeners uh, can, can look forward to that then. Th thanks awesome. for your time, Yami. Best of luck with Pleasure. it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Cheers.